Thank you guys for joining. Uh, I want to introduce myself and let my colleague introduce herself as well. My name is Kevin Richmond. I'm an innovation specialist at OECD, specifically within the Observatory for Public Sector Innovation. Hi all, I am Pira Tenoris from the Seymour Observatory from the OECD, and I'm the lead on system thinking and innovation measurement at the observatory. So today, uh, we're going to continue our series around public sector innovation, specifically around uh, skills and how you actually do it. Um, so for people that uh, this is your, your first one, um, this is still really a, a test run for us. This is uh, something that we're experimenting with because we've had a lot of demand for it. We've had a lot of people asking us to um, really go all around the world speaking about these types of things, uh, which can be very uh, exhausting and time consuming. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, it's really important to have this dialogue and have these conversations. So we thought, why not do this over webinar and do it electronically? And uh, it could be a more efficient way to get this message out. Um, with that said, because we had so many people register, um, we have everyone muted now because we don't want the dreaded one person that's unmuted that is making noise for everyone else so they can't hear any of us. Um, so instead, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the chat box in WebEx. Uh, we have someone monitoring it. We'll make sure to stop a, a couple of times during our conversation and uh, answer any questions that, that you guys have. Um, additionally, we're going to ask for feedback at the end. Again, we're trying to improve this every time. The first time you guys just had to listen to me for an hour, which uh, I'm very happy that I could provide someone else this time to, to uh, give you guys some more uh, diversity and different thoughts than, than just myself. And I'm sure everyone, including my wife, would be tired of hearing me talk after uh, an hour straight. Um, so with that, let's go on to why we are doing this. So why Innovation 101? So when we talk about innovation, typically, you hear about these resounding successes and you hear about this robot that can do flips and it was trending on Twitter and Facebook and all these different websites about how they were able to do this. What you don't see on the back end is everything else that happens before this grand, amazing thing. And you see all the failures, all the false starts, all the false steps that happen. And so it ends up happening with innovation, especially in the public sector where failure is not something that we like to talk about that often, is we celebrate these triumphs. We celebrate these grand successes and we really love to show how we're doing things differently when it works out. But you never see the things that happen beneath the surface there. And one of the really great things that I love working at OECD and working at the observatory is all of us have been public sector innovators all of us have worked in public sectors around the world, and we know how hard it is to actually innovate in the public sector. And so we wanted to demystify some of that and really pull back the curtain and show what it really takes through these steps. So why us? What is the observatory? For any of you that have not been fully engaged with us, just really, really quickly. Um, so the observatory was founded in 2013 and um, we work really closely with the European Commission and innovation groups and, and governments all around the world. And we're really focused on uncovering what's next, where we're really trying to identify those innovative practices at the edge of government. And those are anywhere that they are occurring in the world, OECD, non-OECD countries, national, sub-national. Uh, we're really trying to see what is the cutting edge that's happening. Um, we also, like I said, work directly with government. So we provide that trusted advice um, and we are identifying contextual and system specific barriers to innovation. A lot of Peretz work is really based on uh, systems thinking and how do you apply that in the public sector to solve problems and, and solve emergent issues. Um, and then turning it into the new normal. So what types of frameworks, things like what we're doing now and methods that we can help countries move along to understand and conceptualize what is innovation um, get their head around it uh, a little bit better because a lot of people have a lot of different definitions of what innovation is and how you do it. Um, and none of them are really that, none of them are wrong. Um, everyone just has a different context, which is really important. Um, but then we can start having a shared understanding of these things. So 
we have a innovation life cycle. Uh, in this innovation life cycle, uh, our first webinar was really around identifying problems. And this one's gonna be around generating ideas. Um, but you can see future webinars would be around how we develop proposals, how we actually do the implementation, uh, and then we have evaluation and diffusing. So really briefly, wanna talk about problem framing, because you're gonna hear Brett and I talk about it a lot during ideation, because it is so, so critical. So the example that we have up here is uh, a basic double diamond that you use in design, where there's a problem definition phase and a creating solutions phase. And it's broken up into some sub, sub phases of discover, investigate, identify options, and validate and recommend. So the challenge is in the public sector, most civil servants end up starting after the investigate phase. We are given a problem that is already defined for us. Sometimes we're even given a solution that we need to just implement. So you're, you're moving even past the identify options and you're just like, this is what we're going to do. Um, and that's where our starting point is. We don't really get to investigate. And so when you start leaving behind the problem framing and you really don't spend any time there, what ends up happening is you get a lot of negative results. You have a lot of projects that end up not giving the return on investment or value that you expect them to give. And instead, what ends up happening is people are generally disappointed and uh, confused as to why something failed. So what we advocate for and what we advocated for in the last webinar, which is recorded and it's on our website and on our YouTube page, and we'll send out uh, links to all of that after, um, is that we need to spend more time in problem framing. We need to, even if you've been assigned a specific problem to solve, still look to make sure that you understand the context of the problem and what the problem is and spend more time in the problem definition before starting to move into the solution space. Okay. So, Kevin, are you saying that uh, when uh, public sector is in a kind of a uh, political environment, so if politicians come in and they have solutions in mind already, so there's no room for public sector innovation. We have to just take the solutions and implement them in innovative ways, or are there other ways to go about it? So there's always ways to find areas to innovate. You may not be able to fully redefine a problem within your context if someone, if a politician comes in and says, this is, this is my view for the problem, but there's still lots of space within that to find a better solution um, than what may be proposed. And so there's lots of gray area in there that innovation isn't just about uh, this huge radical transformation that's going to change the world. There's lots of different types of innovation, whether it's you know iterating on something or looking for incremental changes and improvements to what is being proposed. Like there's lots of in between that it's not an all or nothing proposition. Okay. But now we wanna to move to ideation and I can't think of anyone better or more creative. <laughs> uh, and if you share a desk with her, um, you would understand like someone that is one of the most creative people that I, I know, um, talk a little bit about what ideation is. So Pret, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what ideation is and even more specifically, what it's not. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, all lies, all lies. <laughs> so it's always a team effort uh, that makes innovation happen. So it's never kind of a, you know, it's very rare that you have a lead uh, innovator and a lone wolf that makes innovation happen. Uh, it's a, very much a team effort in at the OECD as well. Uh, but I'm very happy to uh, open the black box of uh, innovation a little bit, uh, because as Kevin said, you end up hearing about these uh, great uh, innovations as a robot doing the backflips or artificial intelligence being applied in, in government to solve uh, hurricanes or, or otherwise. So what you usually do not get to hear are the kind of the tears, the sweat that goes into actually uh, making those ideas happen or to come a step uh, even further backwards, where to get the, those ideas in the first place. So what is ideation? We can all go and uh, check uh, Oxford uh, Dictionary and find out it's about formation of ideas and concepts. Okay. Uh, but the idea generation is, is in innovation processes is way more than that. It's about finding the best ideas uh, from, you know, internally, 
from outside sources, from wherever you're going to get them, get them, and actually screening and prioritizing those ideas. So actually filtering out the, the ideas that you want to go forward with. And uh, when we usually talk about ideation with, uh, uh, with people who do not have a lot of experience with innovation, then what comes to mind is the picture that you see. It's a closed room with a lot of post-it notes and sticky notes. Uh, with a lot of ideas uh, as a result of a brainstorming activity. And uh, this is part of uh, creating ideas, but this is not uh, what uh, ideation in government or in innovation processes in also private sector is anymore. So we don't, uh, the best results are not actually pr produced by closing people in the, to the you know, <laughs> closed room, um, you know, a selection of the Pope, <laughs> they come out with the white smoke or, or the black smoke. Uh, we have to explore many different ideas and many different options. Uh, and there are many different ways of doing, doing uh, those processes. So ideation is very much connected to the type of problem of why you're innovating itself. So it's, uh, uh, it's connected to solving concrete issues, exploring very many different options to a specific problem that you don't know how to actually solve. Or, or do yourself, or it's uh, also about signaling to take to the broader crowd of uh, citizens, of companies, or otherwise from the public sector, that these are the problems that we are issues that we are interested in, and uh, you might want to kind of generate the ideas, bring us ideas to actually produce a solution uh, for these um, problems themselves. So. Uh, it's also about creating expectations for solutions. So it's way, way, way broader than uh, just uh, um, closing uh, five uh, people in suits in a, in a room and coming up with the best idea. So before specifically talking about uh, how the best ideas go about, I wanted to tell a little bit about uh, why it matters to really understand the problem you're dealing with, the purpose of innovation itself. So I have a, I have a question for you, Prep, before, before you dive into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to myth bust for me. Oh. A lot of people that I've worked with in the public sector think that they are not meant or qualified to ideate because they're not creative enough. Is that true? Sometimes it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes really misapply. I mean, uh, one of the the major enemies of, uh, of uh, innovation and ideation in the public sector in anywhere is groupthink. When we spend too much time together and we start to think alike, uh, not because we are not creative enough, not because we are uh, not uh, you know, well-read enough or otherwise, but if we don't interact with a varied set of stakeholders, we don't have diversity within our people that we talk to, we usually start to, say, uh, start to have the same vocabulary. We start to kind of appreciate the same kind of ideas because I know what uh, Kevin likes and I like Kevin. And you know, over time, we start to uh, think alike. So creativity is also a resource that has to be created. It doesn't happen on its own. There are, of course, very, very creative individuals, uh, but uh, you can also think about creativity as a resource itself. So yes, there are some people who are clearly more creative than others, who are out of the, out of the box uh, thinkers, uh, but uh, there are also ways to uh, work together. As I said before, innovation is rarely a kind of an individual effort. So it's usually about teams, about people coming together, and there the creativity happens. If I'm confronted with somebody with a, from a different background, for example, from an architect or from an artist uh, who hasn't studied technology and uh, innovation and economics for all their life, then I am also challenged uh, in the ways I'm thinking. So that makes me more creative. So a little bit about, uh, we will come back to the creative part, I think, uh, in the later phases as well, because that's really, really important. Uh, but I really wanted to give a little bit of an insight into the kind of the many uh, faceted nature of innovation itself that the public sector has to deal with. And really to also bust the myth <laughs> regarding uh, uh, innovation being uh, kind of one size fits all, one thing that uh, all public servants have to do the same way. So in our perspective, 
uh, we have two dimensions that we look at innovation from. One is uh, uh, in terms of the type of uncertainty you're dealing with. If it's, uh, you know, from certainty to uncertainty, if you're kind of an explore, uh, exploratory phase or you're in exploiting phase. So, for example, if you're dealing with artificial intelligence or blockchain, we have a huge forum going on here at the OECD at the moment, uh, then usually we don't know where these uh, solutions are going, what uh, type of options are going to be explored. You're dealing with a problem of great uncertainty, but a great promise. So there's a great promise that these things will bring great solutions and create the new possible ways and ideas to actually solve problems in the public sector. Um, dealing with the kind of the certainty or ex exploiting or incremental innovation is a little bit different. It's about uh, um, trying to make existing systems uh, more effective or efficient, trying to exploit as much uh, of the knowledge that already exists. Um, steal as many ideas as possible. So it's not about also about creatively coming up with uh, something that is totally new, uh, but uh, maybe some things that are novel to your context can take you to the next level to enhance uh, innovation, enhance your systems and public services that you're dealing with. And another dimension that we are looking at uh, innovation and problems uh, people connected to it is is there a very clear direct direction? Is there a top-down demand? Is there a very clear problem of uh, what needs to be solved? So usually uh, the problem uh, definition is uh, uh, that, you, that usually the normal public policy policymakers deal with the kind of uh, the first type of innovation that you are given a problem to solve. You have a mission to solve. Um, you have a reform of the education system, for example. You have to make the tax system or, or a certain tax component more effective. Uh, so you start your process there. And uh, your people expect very clear outcomes from that process. Of course, you can integrate innovation to it as well. And then there's this area of adaptive innovation where you are um, trying to experiment with many different things. You're maybe you're in this kind of user-driven phase where you can actually see from the bottom up uh, that uh, citizens are experiencing public services in different ways. And the feedback that comes back from them uh, is signaling that things are not going the right way. We can quickly experiment with new ways of designing services. We don't have to have the top leadership involved to actually make things better very quickly. And in those uh, four quadrants, uh, it is very, uh, actually what type of ideas you're looking for and why are you looking for them are very, very different. So uh, if we are in areas uh, where we are, there's a high level of an uncertainty connected to it, uh, uh, then, uh, then uh, we also inside the public sector probably don't know the right answers then we have to actually look for the signals coming from outside, look for the technology developers or other partners who have the knowledge or the intake to actually do things. If we're dealing with uh, design-oriented uh, problems or citizen-oriented problems to me, these are the stakeholders that we have to look through. So good ideas come from very different uh, sources. And specifically, we have to love the problem to understand why are we innovating. So if you have a clear problem to solve or you are trying to uh, enhance the experience of citizens uh, to innovate from those sources, then the tools of why, how to actually create the ideas or source the ideas are very different. And different components uh, in line with the previous model that you uh, may be interested in looking at are connected to innovation maturity, uh, system aspects and also the system players. So previously I connected to, uh, I covered a lot of the dimensions of why different stakeholders become, the involvement of different stakeholders in ideation processes becomes important based on the purpose of innovation. Uh, but also components as uh, leadership buying, for example. You, if you're dealing with mission-oriented innovation, and you need ideas to solve a concrete problem, that problem probably needs to be defined uh, concretely already by the senior leadership. Uh, you have to have uh, different types of aspects. So these are 
three different categories of things that start to play in a different format within those four categories of innovation. So we talk a lot um, internally around appropriate ideas for the right context. And so I think the, the two things you just laid out help define that, but how do you kind of know um, where you are in that regard? So if you're, you know, how do you know that what you're in an uncertain versus certain environment um, where if you fall in love with the problem, oftentimes you feel like y everything is certain. I have mm -hmm. studied something for three years. I understand it. I think this is a very understandable environment that I understand the system and the player. So therefore, I am developing ideas as if it is a, a concrete and certain problem as opposed to uncertain. So how do you gauge like kind of where you are along that spectrum, depending like what problem you're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. So if you know, do, that's the basic first line of things. If you know, do, but uh, do keep in mind that there's a lot of expert bias out there. So uh, in the field of innovation, at least, if we are unsatisfied with the outcomes that we are actually reaching, yeah, with public services, then we need to start looking for totally different types of ways of doing things. And uh, then the expertise is actually standing in, in the way a little bit, especially in the ideation phase, where you're trying to expand the, the potential options as much, much as possible. So this is the first part of the ideation, that you try to get as many ideas as possible uh, on the board so you can start to filter what fits for purpose what fits for the ideas and otherwise so that means that uh, we also have to be careful about uh, pulling ourselves a little bit back and be open to different types of ideas especially if the you know innovation is the goal so if you're dealing with the normal kind of you know change reform or implementation of things that are known this will make things uh, act more efficiently, then, you know, you can skip the process and do your policy. And that's it. Great. So I think we're going to jump to some questions uh, quickly. And one was uh, based on something you said originally, Perret. So how do you increase creativity? So this is a very uh, great question, especially in the public sector context, because uh, I don't think that uh, in the public sector, creativity uh, has been specifically looked at as a resource to innovate the innovation, uh, innovativeness. So one of the major, major sources of creativity itself is to expand the number of experiences, background of people uh, that are behind the table when you actually ideate or talk, uh, or even in the phase of talking about the problem who are the kind of the stakeholders of it. So if in the ideation phase, you involve people who think in a different way, have different experiences from you, or you also have to involve the represent representation of the population that you're trying to affect uh, into that phase, uh, and you also maybe build a little bit of conflict into the process, and then more creative ideas can come forward. And uh, of course, I mean, it always in innovation teams, it is always very important to always challenge yourself and be wary of groupthink. So groupthink happens, uh, you can't uh, fight against it. I mean, three to four years in every team, uh, people already start to talk alike, have the same vocabulary, and you don't have constructive conflict anymore. And that is kind of the death of creativity. So you also have to have uh, mobility of people, uh, you know, you can challenge people with different ideas, but you can also rotate people in teams uh, from time to time to actually counter against that. The other thing that I'll add is, so one of the classes that, that I took in my postgraduate studies was actually a creativity class. Mm -hmm. um, and so one thing about creativity is it doesn't just mean coming up with new ideas. Mm -hmm. You had, Perrette had referenced earlier, the adaptivity. Um, so actually what our core project was having to find a uh, use for a Xbox, a video game system, and apply it in a new way that could help solve a problem in a different industry. Mm -hmm. So it's really the idea of, it's not just, maybe you're not the person that comes up with, you're the first person to ever come up with Uber. 
but you see something that is out there on the market that is new and you say, how can this be applied in my context? And that in and of itself is another version of creativity that often is not um, highlighted or celebrated as much as the people that just come up with the off the wall idea and way outside the box. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is reading a diverse set of things that are out there. I mean, with, with the age that we are in, in terms of the amount of information at our fingertips, constantly pulling from a diverse set of, of information to be challenging your assumptions, challenging um, your thinking, understanding what is possible that is out there and seeing what is really cutting edge on the market also helps you think that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you hit upon a very good uh, point there in your first uh, part of your, your you know, not learning, the, second. the learnings from the creativity <laughs> class. Uh, is that people need to have experience with actually doing innovative or creative projects to be more creative uh, after yeah. the fact. So you need to actually have the experience with uh, uh, kind of uh, you know thinking outside of the box, applying those kind of ideas in practice to become more creative. So uh, also in the public sector, there has to be a opportunity to test ideas just because of it, to know if, you know, because maybe they could work and uh, to give the people the experience of doing it. And that actually makes them more creative. So I'm going to uh, jump to a different question real quick because uh, it's on the screen right now because you guys are asking a lot of questions and our, our person is rapidly trying to make sure that we see them. Uh, but uh, Sebastian had asked, how do you manage this expertise barrier that you speak of when most public officers do not recognize that their expertise is becoming a narrow point of view? Um, so I'll take the, the first stab at that, which is really bouncing off of what Perrette just talked about, which was getting experience that is not just behind a desk. So lots of times expertise is defined by degrees. Expertise is defined by your years of doing something. Um, very often, especially in the public sector, it's rarely defined by a lived experience or daily interaction with people that have the lived experience of which you're developing policy services, whatever. Um, so one of the ways to get people uh, that I've experienced within my time in the government um, to get people to open up is to have them directly engage with the problem, um, not just be seen as a subject matter expert that is, is brought in because they've been doing it for 20 years, they understand the problem, but making sure that they are actually involved in interacting with the citizens and policy and, and issue that they're actually trying to solve. Mm -hmm. But I would especially, because my background is in system thinking and transformative change, so uh, I usually like to uh, flip the idea from problems to actually outcomes. So we start to we start from uh, observing: Are we satisfied with the outcomes that are basically the result of your expertise? Are we satisfied with the status quo as is? If the answer is no, then we can also create a little bit of uh, urgency or understanding that things are not correct that uh, maybe what we have been doing from A to B to C over the number of years is not actually working the right way. And that opens people up to explore new types of ideas and new types of things mm -hmm. and uh, else to uh, uh, kind of counteract that. And in terms of practicality uh, of if you bring different types of stakeholders together to have these kind of conversations, then one of the key factors is facilitation. It's good facilitation to, uh, to say, uh, to, to tell people that uh, now you leave behind your expert hat, now we're going to actually dive into the problem uh, in its entirety from blank slate. We're looking at it from a new, and it requires, you know, objective, critical, outside voices usually to create that space. So let's I'm going to ask you the favorite question that we get asked by every single public servant. Um, when leaders talk the talk of innovation, that they want it, mm -hmm. that they support it, that they agree with it, but they don't walk the walk. So they talk about it, but their actions are not aligned with how they speak. So they're either not actually supporting it or they're actively supporting the status quo. Um, they're not providing resources to innovative activities, um, things that we see that are, are fairly common across the public sector um, in terms of how much innovation is actually supported versus how much it's talked about. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you uh, 
reduce that barrier or that, that gap in misalignment? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are different ways of doing that. So if you're part of an organization where the leadership uh, is engaging with what we call innovation theater, so showing on the top that we are doing a lot and we are engaging and we were committing to it, but not actually giving any capacity, room, slack, uh, resources for innovation itself. So it's kind of a side of the desk activity. People do it out of their their own uh, own time. Uh, then uh, internally, you usually don't have a lot of room to go for the big ticket items that are on the desk of the leadership that is uh, against uh, innovative solutions. You don't have the buy. -in. However, uh, to engage with the Kind of the user and citizen and incremental innovation to try with these projects and to actually have a proof of case projects to show for the high level leadership what they can gain from trying new things so if you can find coalitions any practice in the public sector we talk to innovators a lot then that's how actually innovation happens in the public sector people uh, it is tough they do their pet projects on the side of the test and uh, you know the proof that this is actually going to be uh, a success story and then all of a sudden everybody has to buy in everybody you know we supported it from the, from the get-go <laughs> and that's the reality and uh, we at the observatory will try to from our part uh, from kind of the objective third uh, organization part to also say that this is important we are trying to also influence that uh, dy dynamic uh, in our own way and i would add that um I don't think that leaders are maliciously misaligned, that they're talking the talk but have no interest in walking the walk, um, and, and that they, they don't actively realize a lot of the time that they're actually participating in an innovation theater. A lot of them, um, what, what I have found through working with, with leaders, and we've seen common across our work at, at uh, the observatory, is that leaders don't actually fully understand the process of what it means to innovate and what that process is and how different that process is than the traditional way of working. And because they are unfamiliar with it and it's unclear to them, generally there is some fear in that unknown. So it's maybe not even fear of the unknown of the solution itself, but fear of the process for how you got to that. And it feels less in their control. Um, and many public sector leaders grew up in the public sector system, which means they have adjusted to how the system thinks and how the system traditionally does things rather than some different techniques and methodologies that okay. are in there. And you've got to be able to close that gap as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, talking more concretely about the methodologies, we also have a suggestion uh, checklist for ideation. So what is that? Tell, tell me more. Sure. <laughs> so we'll get to some of these other questions uh, in a bit, but we want to make sure we, we get through some of this material as well. And anything that we do not answer uh, during the, the webinar, we'll make sure to have a, a written response in the email that, that we at least give, give some answers. Um, to all of your questions because because they all are really great. Um, so one of the things that we see uh, uh, a lot is that we talk about this stuff theoretically um, and then people are like, oh, I'm really excited to be able to do this. And then they get back and they're like, how do I get started? How do I actually do this? And so some of the things that we thought would be really useful during this webinar are practical applications, things that you can immediately lift from our webinar and take back with you. And so one of them is just a very basic checklist for ideation to make sure that um, what you're generating is appropriate, uh, it's the right time to move into ideation, um, and, and going through those steps correctly. So this is by far not a comprehensive list. This is the, the most simplistic, like quick five questions that you should be asking yourself while you're going through this process. So the first one uh, should not be surprising because Pratt and I have mentioned it many, many times, which is problem framing. And are you have you spent enough time actually looking at the problem? Have you fallen in love with the problem? Have you really studied the problem? And are you truly ready to move into ideation? Because it is very much human nature to get a little bit of data, assume that you understand everything going on and move straight to the solution phase. But uh, if I don't have a problem at all, but I have a great idea, can I go ahead with it anyway? 
that is how lots of technology projects end up running very, very <laughs> over budget, is having a solution and trying to find a problem for it. Um, while that is certainly not uh, when you start moving into the emergent space and the transformation space, um, it could be important to start playing with new solutions to see how they can be adapted to your context. Um, so there's certainly room for that. Um, it's not a habit that you want to get into as your only mode of, of operating. Um, then do you know the innovation environment? So this gets back to uh, the table that Perret was talking about of, is this top down? Is this bottom up? Do you know how resistant your leadership will be to change, especially in the topic area that you're looking at? It's important to know as you start thinking about the ideation, um, how much leeway you may have and what the environment is in terms of the political environment, uh, your organizational environment, the outside actors, um, everyone that's being involved in the system. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as well, uh, some problems public sector has very little control over. So, especially when connected to uh, social services and changing people's behavior, which is so, so hard because it depends on people's own choices. So, it also means that uh, you have to have the buy-in, you have to co-create some of the solutions to really make it uh, significant and to matter to people that they've actually do so and take some re responsibility in some ways. So you have to have them behind the table mm -hmm. also when you're already kind of selecting solutions or looking at different solutions. Well, and that really gets into the, the third one, which was, mm -hmm. does your ideation strategy match your environment? Um, so uh, one some of the things we had talked about is when you're in the less concrete space, when you're in the emergent space, um, where there's not a lot of um, potentially even expertise within your organization, you know, what strategy you use to gain your ideas is just as critical um, as just generating ideas. And so there are lots of different strategies out there. But when you think about a, a lot of people have done ideas hunt or ideas challenges, um, public consultations, and the idea challenges can be within an organization, within government, outside of government. Um, but there's the public consultations that occur as well to, to try to drive um, citizen engagement. There's a, a lot of areas in citizen engagement, and I know somebody asked a question about that as well. Um, but then there's also uh, more concrete and understood areas where you may not need a huge broad range of ideas generated from anywhere and everywhere, um, where you have, there, there's less uncertainty. You're, you're fairly certain of the problem and you can do a smaller select group of people. Um, with that said, um, you still need to make sure, and then I'll jump to number five and then go back, you still need to make sure that your strategy allows everyone to contribute. So this goes back to everyone thought the ideation strategy was you go into a room, you have a bunch of sticky notes, and as long as most of those sticky notes have things written on them and they end up on the wall, then we have done a good job ideating. Um, we know now that one, groupthink is an issue, but also people work in very different ways. And just because someone is not an extrovert, and so they do not thrive in that type of high movement on your toes environment, doesn't mean they don't have very valid and strong contributions to give. And so you really need to be considerate about making sure that your ideation strategy allows everyone to be able the time to come up with creative and good ideas in the method that works best for them. Mm -hmm. And some, some people are not very quick thinkers. So the good idea might come in 20 minutes, three hours, you a know, week. a week. So you have to also build in a little bit of uh, time reflectiveness. Right. A lot of people think ideation is a two to three hour mm -hmm. activity. Um, it really can stretch for days mm -hmm. um, and weeks to make sure that you are truly getting the best ideas and combining ideas and seeing how they all play together. And we'll get into the, the layering piece mm -hmm. um, for how to sift through them as well. Um, but then do you have the right people engaged? And I think the most important part that, that OPSI is really starting to dive into more now is, is that a diverse group? Um, do you have a group with diverse backgrounds, diverse thinking, um, gender diversity? Really, you need to make sure that your group is not a lot of people from the same background with the same education level, um, with the same lived experiences, all trying to come up and solve a problem, um, it ends up not working out that well. You really need a strong pool of diversity 
to generate ideas that may not be outside the box, but may be outside the box for a specific person. Mm -hmm. So this list is just a, a really quick list of, of five when you start thinking about your ideation strategy. So are we ready to move into ideation? And then how we do ideation, um, I think are really, really important as just a, a quick checklist for are you doing this the right way and systematically rather than falling into the, the trap of we grab people into a room and do sticky notes. Mm -hmm. But indeed, uh, first of all, to make it a little bit even more concrete, it starts with uh, with the problem itself. So are you de dealing with uh, a problem that you know that uh, we want to have a solution, but we have no idea? Then you might want to go as broad as possible and utilize crowdsourcing uh, challenges, for example, if you have a very specific question in mind, uh, that these are the tools to actually utilize. Uh, but for example, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, complex issues and very wicked problems in terms of poverty and uh, you know other really, really uh, tough problems that the public sector has tried to uh, try to solve for ages, then you might want to go deeper in the engagement, uh, build the engagement more narrowly to really explore the different co causal relationships or the kind of contradicting causal relationship that are connected to these wicked issues. So you might want to explore co-creation with a specific uh, representative group of uh, of the target group that you are uh, you're dealing with, or you will want to have citizens juries or a, a reference balance that you have, want to have uh, in present, or even use pitching to some sort uh, with the kind of relevant stakeholders, bring these ideas to, to the table. Yep. So there are many tools out there and what's interesting is that is we we have a colleague that worked in an innovation group that her challenge was the the framing of the problem was how do we eliminate homelessness mm -hmm. um, and that's one of those wicked problems that has uh, is extremely complex mm -hmm. um, and with that framing of problems it puts you into uh, you go through an ideation phase and you go through a testing phase um, but the framing was such that you thought you could eliminate it, um, mm -hmm. where when they were starting to look at how to do this, it became very much that we need to reframe the problem to mm -hmm. start thinking about solutions, because the way that we framed it, um, we can't actually solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that gets into a more narrow focus, like how can we go from saying we're going to solve this super complex problem with a two or three step solution into how can we solve parts of these problems that can help alleviate the issue mm -hmm. um, without completely solving it. Exactly. Um, so the other practical takeaway that can help you with this, and, and this is from, and most of the stuff that we just uh, presented is from a ideation report uh, that we will also link to in uh, this email that, that we'll send afterwards, um, really looks at rating and, and judging how well you understand the problem and are, are ready to ideate and position yourself to be in the right mental state to ideate based on the environment that you're dealing with, the complexity of the problem that you're dealing with, the certainty of the problem, um, what facet or what area um, that, that Perret had presented in earlier in regards to what type of innovation you're looking to do. Um, it can help you get in that right mindset to, to help you guide these problems. So things like, have you actually clearly defined the problem? How certain is it? Um, is there an agreement about the problem? Which oftentimes you would not, uh, you would be shocked at how often people don't actually agree what the actual problem is. So do you have an agreement around that, which can reduce barriers in terms of ideating and actually executing on some of these projects? Um, is the problem likely going to stay the same or shift? Um, are there existing solutions? Uh, is there a previous experience and is there a clear engaged owner of the problem and high level uh, discretion about how to respond? And so by filling these out on just a, a one to five scale, you can start to even just through a self-assessment, start to understand how your organization um, or even the public sector as collective is ready to respond to some of these problems that you're trying to deal with. Um, which can help guide you in not just the ideation process, but the 
problem defining process or the problem defining part of the process as well as all the way through past ideation to proposals to actual execution and assessment. Um, so this is again another uh, takeaway that you can just lift and use on your own and as you start using these things if you find them really helpful or don't find them helpful at all uh, either way you can give us some feedback on these because uh, we're always looking to iterate on anything that, that we uh, design and, and hand out because uh, we want this stuff to be useful for you guys. So the one thing that we haven't talked about yet, um, and I know there's even more questions now, so it uh, looks like we're going to have a lot of typing potentially to do afterwards, uh, is so you generate all these problems. You, are you, gen you figured out the problem. You've generated all these different solutions. You've generated incremental solutions, way outside the box solutions. You have hundreds of potential ideas for how to solve this problem. Um, at some point, you've got to start narrowing it back down. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that initial sifting, um, maybe not to get to one single idea, but to get to a handful of ideas that people have really rallied behind that you say, like, these are a good group of ideas that will either give us more information um, or could potentially even solve the problem. So I think this is the kind of the crucial bit that uh, gets as little airtime as possible, because this is actually what happens regularly in the public sector. We do public consultations, we have tons and hundreds and hundreds of ideas coming in from citizens or even from other ministries and other bodies. And all of a sudden we have, you know, three solutions or policy proposals out there. And then we are, you know, how do you get there? On what on what basis did you make the selection of? You know, secret sauce. It happened. <laughs> it, we we went to the room, and this was the solution that we we came up with. So I think this is kind of crucial because in the public sector we should also be uh, transparent in how we do things. And uh, also here uh, we saw see in practice that there are many many problems with actually, especially in this phase. So we have broadened the scope. We have so many ideas as possible for innovative solutions, but how do we get to those ones that we actually want to explore? And how do you get to the best idea and not the most popular person behind it or the most loudest person behind it or the one with the most, uh, you know, biggest coalition uh, of people behind a certain idea? So how to actually get to the best ideas uh, that are fit your problem and your problem statement that you're doing with. So if you Google this problem, if you Google this question, how do I filter ideas in an innovation process, then usually you get an answer of, uh, of very simplified scoring models that have different components from novelty, usefulness, value, acceptance, legitimacy, feasibility, visibility, risk, endurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, basically, you know, you anonymize ideas, which is usually very difficult to do, actually. Uh, and uh, you get people to score. And then you average scores and see which are above your line or uh, what the clusters uh, actually come out with are. This is a very simplified method, actually, doing it. So I'm going to flip it back again to the purpose of... Uh, of innovation itself. So you cannot have one model to filter ideas. Because for example, uh, if you are interested in mission-oriented innovation, your goal is to solve poverty and you're looking for innovative ideas for that, then one of the main things uh, is, uh, is to actually the consistency of the idea with the mission itself. Does it systematically help to go towards uh, that solution that I'm looking for? There might be many, many ideas connected to it that they might want to keep and explore further. But if it isn't consistent with the mission of uh, where we actually want to go and the fit between the purpose and the actual activity, then that might be the most important selection criteria. So here, novelty doesn't matter. I mean, if it's an old idea, as long as it works, that matters. But when we are in the field of anticipatory radical ideas, when we're actually, we don't know, we have this uh, purpose that we want to, we're interested in new technologies or new things popping up. We are having this, we're in this uncertain phase of, uh, of exploring new ideas like blockchain or otherwise. And then uh, here, for example, legitimacy doesn't matter because your existing feedback system says, you know, it doesn't fit our model. 
So uh, uh, also, for example, these ideas are usually very, very risky. So the risk proposition doesn't matter. So the simplistic scoring mechanisms do not work uh, across the board of different things of how to explore it. Um, another thing that uh, tends to happen in the public sector is that you you have these shark tanks or dragon dens where people come and pitch ideas. But as I uh, kind of indicated before, uh, people are very different. So in these kind of situations where you are putting people against the panel in a very con confrontational situation where they have to basically defend their idea, it usually becomes about pure person's characteristics and how they can sell themselves rather than the idea itself. And a lot of people who are interested in innovating um, in the public sector actually do not never, do not go to these panels, do not go to these, uh, these formats. So it's really if you want to have a consistent, like have a, a as an inclusive uh, filtering strategy for innovation in your in your organizations, then you want to explore different types of methods to actually uh, actually uh, uh, filter out ideas. So I'm not saying do not do scoring, do not do panels, do not do others, but be aware that uh, uh, in these type of things, uh, uh, the person's characteristics and the biases that come along with people being behind the ideas and pitching ideas is going to matter a lot in terms of the selection itself. I think the important thing here is that there's not just one solution. It's not just this is the way that you narrow things down. We're always going to do a Shark Tank or pitch competition. We're always going to do this scoring methodology um, that you have to be cognizant of really what your goals are and what the outcomes uh, and implications of each strategy is to mm -hmm. find the best one, depending on what you're trying to yeah. do. And not always uh, there is a best one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as I said, in the mission oriented side, if your goal is to solve poverty, then you might want to explore many ideas that fit together to actually solve that uh, problem systematically. Uh, on the other side, you're exactly, if you're exploring different options in an iterative way, you might end up with a list of five to 10 different options that you can actually explore that you again experiment and see what happens. If we literally, you can be in the frame of uh, like all of these uh, things can work, but let's try it out. All right, so we're going to, we have a couple minutes left. I'm gonna uh, challenge Perrette that we're gonna be super concise mm -hmm. and we're gonna try to rapid fire answer some of these questions mm -hmm. up here. Um, so thank you guys for all submitting your questions. Uh, so I'm gonna start with, um, uh, Miguel Ludwig uh, talking about capabilities uh, is only understood at the individual level. What about the organizational capabilities and how do you ex uh, assess the level of existed capabilities? Um, so it's a question we get asked a lot. We do have a question as you know that is getting longer and longer by the minute. Um, but, uh, but uh, so we do, those are still at the individual level, but you can scale that to the organizational level. But when you move to that organizational level, you start moving into not just about skills, but it's about uh, the motivations to do so. Um, it's about the, it's the AMO model. So it's uh, abilities, motivations, opportunities. Do people actually have the opportunity within an organization to build their innovative skills and practice their innovative skills? Are they incentivized to do so in terms of motivation? Um, and so when you start looking at that organizational capability level and building at the organizational level, it's not just about building individual skills, it's about building a, a culture and building a practice that innovation is not this thing on the side as Brett mentioned mm -hmm. yes, uh, earlier, but it becomes just a normal thing that we do. All right, your turn, grab a, another yeah. question. Nope. No, no, yeah. but I, I, I really <laughs> want to say this that you, uh, uh, the, also, the team level is crucial for innovation. So I don't believe in lone wolf, superman innovators. So uh, as, as I said as well with the creativity, uh, one of the things to look for is innovation teams and how to build creative, creative innovation teams who have different backgrounds, uh, diversity built into it because it becomes a source for new ideas and new ways of operating. All right, your turn. You have to read some of this okay. because I am blind. <laughs> Um, okay, can you speak at all to the interplay and relationship between workplace civility and innovation creativity? Mm 
So I love this, uh, this question because it's usually the idea that uh, the innovator is the, is the loud, abrasive uh, person that uh, questions everything and is critical of everything. Uh, yes, there is, uh, you know, uh, part of innovation is also questioning the status quo. Um, but uh, what are the rules of the game of within organizations uh, that things don't become toxic or ugly to pursue innovation is to keep the topic uh, topics at hand. So we have many confrontations and issues and fights, you know, fights, but over professional of content. Mm -hmm. We do not have issues on a personal level. So we can have constructive critique and discussions about what is the right solution or which idea is the best uh, and really go heavily at it. Uh, but we respect each other as individuals. And I think that goes outside of the innovation uh, process as well, that these, this in a 21st century organization are the rules of the game, that we have a safe environment to disagree, uh, but we don't uh, attack each other as, uh, as persons. So we're only going to be able to answer one more, and then the rest of them, I promise, we, we will give a, a written response to. Uh, so how do you innovate in emerging countries? And do you think emerging countries can only transfer innovations, or do they generate them too? So, so I'll, I'll start um, by saying emerging countries sometimes are the most innovative countries that we see out there, um, because oftentimes they don't have this institutional in infrastructure in place that does not allow them to make some of these massive transformation and massive leaps. So you see some of the most creative um, innovations, especially in regarding public sector and public service and, and social services out there from emerging countries, um, especially because they also don't have as much to invest um, to make these huge, massive solutions that they're really bootstrapping a lot of these solutions and testing a lot of things to, to see what is working. Um, I think yeah. uh, the, one of the major things that the, why developing countries, for example, are so innovative at the moment, because we are at this uh, paradigmatic shift in both the private sector and the public sector at the same time. Uh, and uh, what I, I really truly think that developing countries have uh, a much needed uh, kind of positive bias in that process or a little bit of a leeway in that process because they are not uh, locked down by bad dependency of very institutionalized uh, uh, ways of doing things or addressing problems uh, that you see in developed countries. So in developed countries, radical innovation is usually killed off in a very efficient manner uh, because we are doing things already in a certain way and we are best at doing this, but we are at this precipice or, or the, at, at the precipice of time where very fundamental shifts in how public organizations work are happening and uh, developed countries who actually have the knowledge uh, and the, the kind of the motivation to engage with that can move more faster, much, much, much faster uh, than countries that uh, have to deal with the backlog of of very institutionalized systems. So that actually brings us to the last thing we were going to mention before we ended, which was we have some great examples of that from our last um, government innovations report uh, from 2018, or from 2000, yes, from 2018, mm -hmm. but we have our call for innovations um, for public sector innovations that is happening right now that actually closes on September 14th. Uh, so if you have any examples of public sector innovations that you think are um, noteworthy and interesting, and this doesn't have to be blockchain and AI, um, but really any innovations that you see, anything that is changing the context and driving new results and changing how people work and how people interact with public service, increase its value. Um, we want to hear about them and we're, we're collecting a case study library. Uh, we, we have a case study library already now and where these will all filter into that. But in addition to that, uh, we do a uh, publication every single year where we start looking at what uh, submissions have been given and seeing what patterns are being driven in the public sector 
right now in regards to innovation. Um, and the top ones uh, we will bring to Paris uh, to speak at the Observatory for Public Sector Innovations conference, um, as well as if they are chosen to be a, a semifinalist, they end up actually going to the UAE in February to be at the World, World, World Government Summit. Government Summit. Um, and so it's a, a really cool opportunity. Um, we recommend you check out the, the case study library, even if you don't submit one, if you are looking for inspiration and seeing what other people are doing around the world for innovations. Um, but everyone is doing, uh, everyone probably on this call is doing something innovative, something new in their context. And we wanna hear about those because the more that we're a community, um, the better, the better we have um, diffusing lessons learned, the better that we can create a more cohesive community because we're all in this together, all attempting to make public service better. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, this webinar. I hope it was useful. I hope you you gained some great information from it. I want to thank Perrette for her time and, and her knowledge uh, and the information that she shared. I want to thank uh, the other people in this room that you don't see on the mm -hmm. camera that were, were helping us make sure that this was possible. Um, and we really want to encourage you to uh, join our community as well. So we do have a community online. Um, and, and again, more information will be sent in the email for adding to that. It'll allow you to sign up for our newsletter so you can get monthly updates from us. Um, we really have a, a great blog with a lot of information that is there. And as well, as I said, the, the call for innovations are open now. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you guys so much. Um, and hopefully you will join us. We, we have a, another one scheduled uh, TBD, but in, in early October. And so we're going to be talking about how you develop those proposals and how you actually assess what uh, ideas you end up actually doing some experiments with. Mm -hmm. So thank everyone again, and uh, hopefully you'll join us soon. And uh, we look forward to chatting with you on our platform. Thank you. Thank you.